Hey everyone, this is going to be a bit of heavy news, but uh, Chad is no longer with the company. Um, it was not a voluntary departure and uh, out of respect of everyone involved, we're not going to be sharing uh, the details of it. Uh, the podcast is still going to continue and give you the same science-backed info to make you faster as normal. And uh, we're going to have a continuing, you know, rotating new guests as we always have and the regular hosts that you're uh, familiar with. It. So that's it. Um, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. It's the only podcast dedicated to making you faster. And today we're going to be talking about really hitting home on consistency. Uh, Nate, when we look at data on training, everything else, the overbearing, like it's kind of like no matter what variables you're looking at, consistency has the bigger impact in almost every situation than the variables you're looking at, right? Like it's, it's, it, it's key. It's not just us. It's all sports and all like research. There's diet all progress health, everything. in life yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much it's just yeah. life yeah for sure so we're going to talk about that we're going to go through some actionable tips on how to be more consistent uh because a lot of us always think that man i need to find that secret workout uh that secret format uh, or the different training intensity distribution the different nutrition something like that in the end if you just find ways to be more consistent you'll get faster that's like across the board it, it's key so we're going to talk about that we're going to talk about racing versus training lots of good stuff uh but first before we do that a quick update that i wanted to share with everybody we have updated our polarized plans so uh to, to give people a recap Polarized training is, has wildly different definitions depending on who you're asking. <laughs> it's kind of bounces all over the place, but traditionally it's considered to have a training intensity distribution of 80% low intensity and 20% high intensity. That low intensity is everything below your first or like VT1, LT1. So that's like the sort of thing where you're talking like Z2 and below. And then all the high intensity stuff is your threshold and above. Uh, we've released those plans. They've been in early access for quite a while. So the way that you had to access them was through your account and then you'd enable them and then you could see the plans. Uh, we've collected lots of different data on those and we've looked at lots of different athletes using them over the time. And we've listened to your feedback, most importantly, for those that have done it. And we're making some changes to the plans, pulling them out of early access. So they'll live just like uh, time crunch plans, traditional base, lots of other plans that you can find in our catalog that, um, that are in there and you'll be able to find them. So the changes, I want to go over that. And once again, this is really feedback driven here on, uh, for the base phase. Uh, one of the biggest things that we've done is we have changed the ramp rate of the endurance days to be lower. That means that week over week, it's going to, you're not going to progress so rapidly through endurance so that you're doing harder endurance workouts. Instead, it's going to keep it lower. And we've also increased the number of endurance workouts. For the high intensity side of things in base, you're only going to be doing threshold work for the one to two days a week that you do instead of threshold and VO2 work. Um, and then in addition to that, there's also a lower ramp rate for that and more threshold workouts being added for build. There's still a lower ramp ramp rate with endurance. Once again, we're not ramping that one up any faster than you would in the base phase. However, uh, we still keep the ramp rate slightly. Um, it's still somewhat high for the, build. Well, you, yeah, what is, what do you mean by ramp rate? Oh yeah. So that's like, um, a week. I'm going to try to, I'll do it outside of trainer road definition. Then I'll do it uh, inside as well. So then people can understand that way. Ramp rate is how hard your workouts are like week over week, how hard they're progressing. So if you do one workout one week and then the next week you really take a big jump up and it's really difficult, that would be a high ramp rate. Whereas if the following week is just something where it feels just a small bit, uh, t tougher or more difficult then that would be a lower ramp rate. Uh, so that's what we've done. And in order to emphasize the high intensity work in the build phase, we've kept that ramp rate higher than the endurance rate, but we have reduced it from what it was in the original plan still. So it's going to be a bit more sustainable and you'll get VO2 and threshold work in that build phase. Uh, the we've added VO2 and threshold workouts. We're continually adding those and we're adding more endurance workouts for that as well. So, um, we've also made like some subtle tweaks, um, some kind of like under the hood stuff. And I don't really need to get into that uh, and share that secret sauce, but we've made some <laughs> subtle tweaks to it as well. Uh, it's exciting. So if you want to check those out, you can go to training plans and you'll be able to see those plans and you'll be able to use them, check them out, go through all that cool stuff. So I don't think you said this specifically, but they're no longer in early access They're in the regular training plan section now, uh, Correct. to ramp rate. I've heard of other ways of saying of that's the TSS week over week. And this is more about the difficulty because as we know, same TSS, but some, you could, something can be more difficult, um, and thus be, you know, that progressive load without the extra TSS. And the last thing is we have done two different analysis on this. One is we just put these plans, um, we can put these plans on a calendar and we have something that's not available to the public, which is AIFTP prediction. 
which is based on this training load. If you did this, what would be your FTP in the future? Um, and the other one is we just looked at in our data with a human about if you do which plan, which one gets you higher FTP? Because that's for us, we don't, we're not really tied to a specific training methodology, even though, you know, some people might say, so we just want you to be faster because that's how we make money. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, for the, for, for the prediction, if you put both plans in, if you match for volume, uh, TSS volume, uh, it is, it's in with like a lot, which is yeah. as close as AIFTP detection can go. That's, that's the same thing. There's no difference between those two things, uh, which is really cool. And then the other one with the, uh, human analysis, if you match for consistency, if you're actually doing the workouts, um, it's also the same. So this kind of goes back to what we just said before. And if you are drawn to polarized that you that this is, this is the way that you want to work out. Um, because you like it or it's easier with your schedule or whatever, do that. Right. Cause it, yep, that, cause if you're consistent, you're going to be faster. And if you're uh, drawn to the way it is today, that's good too. There's not one based on this thing that we have seen that is inherently superior for athletes that are in our pool, um, a trainer road. And another thing to say about this is people might say, well, you, you know, your data is biased because it's all you know, the training plan stuff, not everyone does our training plans, but also we get the, we, when people sync their data, we get the data before they even use train road. Mm -hmm. So our AI gets to pull that in too, which is, you know, years. That's why we have, what is it? 200 million, 200 rides. million over that. It's yeah. gotta be now. I think it's, <laughs> it's been crazy. like for on trainer road itself, it's like in the 25 upper twenties for millions of rides with us, but we have 200 million total. Uh, so that can tell you that, you know, people have ridden outside and longer than trainer road's been along. And as we bring someone in after, you know, we bring someone in today who's never been on trainer road. We might get 10 years of history for them. They yeah. start training. So that's the, that's the cool thing about it. Uh, basically we haven't seen any, anything that is meaningful enough that the, the, the single comes out of the noise. Yeah. Yeah. A great way to put it, Nate. Um, can I share what I like and dislike about following the plans personally? So then maybe I can give some athletes some context on this. Mm -hmm. Uh, cause I've followed these plans or variations of these plans for the past like year and a half off and on testing with different things. Uh, I love that. I know that two wor workouts of the week, one to two, depending on the volume that I'm doing, right? Low volume one and then mid and high, it's going to be two, but I love that. I just know that just two workouts are going to be like really challenging. Right. And that allows me to kind of like relax my brain a bit and know that like, okay, I can get through today. That's going to be easier. It's no problem. Just those two days really need to fixate on. That's been really helpful in a lot of ways to reduce like anxiety around my training and stress that like, Ooh, I got a really hard workout coming up. Uh, however that said, and I, I like the endurance workouts, but I think that it's hard for a lot of people to do the endurance workouts, uh, because of maybe if they're going to go do them outside, they don't have the terrain, but above all it's the time like, and, and those workouts are inherently longer to get the adaptations that you want, um, in most cases. So it's tricky. It's like a trade-off. Uh, there's time that it could pull me away from my family. And then that adds strain to my schedule. So in that respect, it's not good. But at the same time, if I, you know, every day I'm like, ah, I've got to go hard today or something like that, you know, or I'm worried about something, then that makes it also tougher to enjoy things. So there's really pros and cons and it fits in different seasons of my life. And that's been the cool thing that I found is having the option to bounce back and forth. All you do is you click wherever your training block starts on your calendar, click on that and you can swap from one plan to the next. I don't recommend doing that like, you know, every week or something, <laughs> <laughs> but for a block, it's really helpful to be able to do that. And then, um, maybe you have more time or something, or maybe you have less time and, uh, maybe your particularly stressful time of life and you can swap things around uh, as you wish. It's pretty helpful. So what, what you just said, you mentioned a new feature that we did just like, it's like a little side thing. We haven't really announced it yet. Ivy's been doing these incredible videos on Instagram, showing things in trainer road of like features. <clears throat> and I said, I want to do this feature, but now like Ivy's better at it than I am. So Ivy, you should do this one. Oh, good, cool. Uh, good. <laughs> but as you scroll on the calendar, um, on the upper left, your training plan, the training plan, uh, name, and the block that you're in updates because before we had is you had to find it right on the calendar and it was it was hard to find and yeah. so uh <laughs> if you clicked on it if you click in there you can change the days of the week you can change like hey i want all saturdays to be outside so for instance uh, we're getting the summer as you scroll down you'd be like hey in may in this block you click on it and you go all saturdays i want to be outside workouts and those can automatically push those rides to your garmin or wahoo and then the other rides could all be inside or you can do any you can do all outside it doesn't matter uh and you could follow the plan. So that's, that's a super cool update. Uh, it's out now it's in the desktop too. 
and in um, the web. I don't think it's in mobile yet though. So honestly, the easiest way to manage your training plan is on the website. That's the, that's the go-to spot. And that's where we, when we do new features for the calendar. We do the, the website first because that's where the majority of the usage is and the apps. People usually use it as a player where they open and do it. Although we want to make that, of course, we'll make everything better. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, so like Nate mentioned, stay tuned for that. And uh, Maxine, uh, we'll throw that in, in post here. So then people can see what Nate was talking about, but stay tuned for Ivy's video. That'll break down exactly how to do those things. It's going to be fantastic. And all those surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jira issue created really quickly there. Um, and then in addition to this, Nate mentioned videos. We have fantastic videos coming out every day. Uh, if you go to our social channels on Instagram, on TikTok, if you go to our YouTube channel, which hopefully you're watching this on YouTube right now, and if so, please give it a thumbs up. And if you hit subscribe, then YouTube's gonna say, wow, they really like this content, so I should feed it to other cyclists, and that is how you help us. It's amazing. So uh, if you could do that, that would be great. And check out all the Sarah's, videos that we're making. Sorry, Sarah is doing uh, videos about science, like looking into research and doing like takeaways from that. And the latest one she did was about caffeine and testosterone, which was like, as I'm like holding my giant <laughs> matcha latte. Uh, yeah. Cause there's very interesting. Yeah. There's a study that said that like it was linking, it was like, could caffeine be the cause of low testosterone? Um, and so Sarah dug into the science for it. You should go check it out. It's pretty great on our Instagram channel. Um, and please comment on those. Let's let us know. So we read all of them. Like Right. There's yes. Maxine's here, everyone here. We read all the comments. And uh, if you tell us what you like and what you don't like, both help us. And it just guides us because we literally said at meetings and like look at comments. So if you want something different, let us know. And we have a constant improvement uh, mindset here. And like you get to direct us. You have like mm -hmm. full time people helping you. And I think Ivy stuff, she's focusing right now on uh, product features because there's a lot of stuff in the app that people don't know about that makes training easier or uh, it makes training easier or better. And mm -hmm. that's super cool, too. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's get into, oh, Ivy, sorry. Did you? Oh, uh, in the nature of constant improvement and like Nate, you know, talking about leaving comments and how much it, we want, we want your feedback. Uh, got a lot of requests for hammerhead integration on those outside workout shorts. And I want to provide an update, checked in with Brandon. We're continuing that dialogue with hammerhead, uh, device integration is super tricky. Software integration is tricky. So Thanks for your patience, um, but I want to provide an update that we're working on it. Awesome. Good stuff. Uh, and no Ryan's other information. No time. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask me. I don't know what the yeah. thing is with, with going on with Hammerhead specifically right at the moment, but um, whenever it's a partnership, it's hard because you got two teams with their own roadmaps trying to align on things, and that can be tricky. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Ryan says, hey, pod, and Ryan submitted this question at trainerroad.com slash podcast. If you haven't been there to submit your training questions, please do. It's amazing. Nate said that like you drive us in terms of like the video content we create also with this podcast, like everything we do is driven by you. So when you submit questions, we go through them, we review them, and then we select some for this week. Okay. He says, I started using trainer road and listening to the podcast this year to help me with my first real season of racing. I love both products for the evidence-based approach that y'all take to cycling training and physiology. Thanks, Ryan. That's the goal. Glad you're getting it. Um, I'm racing the tour. Okay. So this is Ryan's first year of racing and he's racing the tour of the Gila, which is Isn't that impressive. Like one of the, <laughs> it's like Utah, one of the biggest races in America in New Mexico. Yeah. It's big. Can, like, or New, New yeah. Yeah. What category does it go all the way down? Uh, they do, I think go down to like cat four, maybe, I don't know. They yeah. might do novice cat five, but I think just still cat four. it's a stage race too, right? Yeah, it's a legit race. <laughs> it's, like it's a lots of UCI climbing. stage race. And uh, yeah, but they do offer categories all the way down. Deep end Ryan, Ryan I hope you here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just you listen like, to every R. podcast. R.I.P., bud. <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll do great, Ryan. I just like your style of just jumping headlong into the, why not, right? Um, yeah. so, not like anyone we know, yeah. 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 All, no, all of us. All. Yeah. Uh, racing the tour of Gila in a couple of weeks and had two questions related to the time trial, <clears throat> which is stage three of this race. Uh, I'll break down the course in a bit, but I just want to first read Ryan's questions. Uh, number one, I have the ability to borrow a TT bike, which I can get my hands on this weekend. That would give me about 10 days to try and dial in the fit and figure out my position. Given how big of a deal arrow is in such an event, is it worth the risk of self fitting this bike? Or should I throw my clip on arrow bars onto my road bike, slam the seat forward and roll with what I know? 
Note that the course has one gradual and one relatively steep climb, and it's an out and back course. And looking at the conditions that they're going to face on race day, I don't trust the wind because I know Gila is notorious for just being like a wind tunnel, like super, super windy. But it says that it's going to be light, light winds, like five to six miles an hour. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't trust it, but just the same. Um, and there'll be crosswinds, kind of like a cross head going out and cross tail going back. We'll get into that in a bit. Then number two, how should I pace this effort? It should be about 40 minutes for me. I think listening to Jonathan talk about his Ironman Oceanside pacing and how he varied his power target for the flats, uphills and downhills got me thinking it will be easy to pace the 2% climb out. Um, how hard do I go on the rolling section and steep uphill section on the return overall? What percentage of FTP would one target for 40 minutes? So I want to go through the course really quick. And then after that, Ivy, I want to ask you about the borrowing a TT bike thing. Something tells me that you've probably been say. in that scenario. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. Nate, you actually like, uh, for Nate, how tall are you for people that don't know? Um, 518. Yeah, we haven't, yeah. we haven't talked about that in like a I know, few it's months been a long actually, time. <laughs> but it's hard for Nate to find TT bikes that fit him. Uh, he was building one up for a really long time. And actually, I think you even chose to kind of go this route of like, I would just want to, if I'm going to do TTs, I want to do my road bike and change it up. So we'll talk about that. But first, the course it's 15.8 miles or 25.4 kilometers. It climbs 1,343 feet or 409 meters. As I said, you're going to have a six mile per hour cross headwind going out and a cross tailwind going back when you turn around. I ran this through best bike split. And I just want to go through the, the numbers in terms of what it predicts that you could have in three different scenarios. So let's just say Wait, you had the, I want, to, I want to say some, John, this is the, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is important. So it's like a false flat, right? For the first, yeah. Uh, what is that for? It's kind of like a drag. Miles. Yeah. It's kind yeah, of like, a, I'm seeing a 2% grade. Yep. 2%, 2, 2 to 3% three, three yeah. is what it fluctuates I'm going to send, send Maxine after recording the profile so that we can maybe put it on the screen. Uh, that's great. Maxine that's can mouse over it. The false flats. I hate them. Don't you all hate them? Cause you <laughs> look hard, at it. You're man. like, why am I going 18 miles per hour at 300 and something Watts? Have you ever like, felt like you're actually like you, it looks like you should be going downhill almost, mm -hmm. but you're not, you're actually going uphill somehow. It just messes with your this head. <laughs> mental thing of like it's sand or like my, my tires aren't inflated properly. Or, you know what I mean? It's, Exactly. I'm like, how did I gain so much weight so quickly? Uh, <laughs> oh, I hate it's them. the worst. So but the two opposite to three, is too, the two percent downhill. Yep, two to three percent going out, and that happens for about four miles. And then after that, uh, like a, f it's a bit steeper descent that you're going to have thereafter, and then it kind of like rolls into the turnaround, and then you just do the same thing in reverse. Um, best bike split. And as far as how you should pace it, it's really helpful because what you can do is you can look at best bike split and it can give you some breakdowns if you want to do that, um, in terms of what you should do. But the rule of thumb that I've typically found in terms of how to pace things is if it's something like a subtle climb, you let yourself drift up somewhere around 5% from whatever the average power would be is typically what best bike split seems to recommend. It's within 5%. And then if it's something where it's actually like, oh, I'm on a climb, like, you know, 6% or something like that, uh, five, 6% and above, then at that point, it typically recommends that you shift up somewhere around 10%, a little under 10%. And you kind of give yourself a window to operate within. And then if it's slightly downhill that you let yourself drop within, you know, uh, 3%, something like that, a small amount. It's kind of like a general rule of thumb, at least that I've seen consistency with, with best bike split. Best bike split might not be perfect. I don't know. It's been pretty impressive at predicting like TT times at like grand tours and stuff. So I, I do think it's like a credible source uh, for that. If you were to be using a TT bike and this is assuming that your aero position is pretty dialed. Okay. So these are like ideal circumstances. There's no way that I'd know your CTA in this case, Ryan and be able or CTA, CTA. and I'd be able to, yeah, sorry, marketing guy. Um, and be able to like plug it all in and figure out, uh, exact numbers, but Assuming your position's dialed on a TT bike, it says that you would do this, and this is roughly 290 watts is what it breaks down to based on your FTP, Ryan. Uh, it breaks down to 34 minutes and 52 seconds for a TT bike. If you were using a road bike with extensions and an aero helmet, it says that you would do it in 3654, so two minutes slower, about 5.8% slower. And then if you were just to use a road bike and you didn't have any sort of aero accoutrement going on, then you would be 3749. That's two minutes and 57 seconds slower. Or in other words, 8.5% slower. So slower than the next one. Yeah. No, no then the TT bike itself. So, oh, so they're pretty um, close. The road clip ons it's two, two and what? 
it's it's all it's almost a minute different. So it is it's not it's it's pretty significant in terms of time. If you're really going for GC, a minute's nothing to you know shake a stick at, as they say. So um, in this case, man, I looking at this and Ivy, tell me what your experience is with borrowing a TT bike. I feel like uh, we've heard before that like the benefit of a TT bike isn't necessarily the bike as much as the position it allows yourself to be in. But if you're borrowing somebody else's bike. Who knows what your position is going to be? Right. And who knows <laughs> what different muscles you'll be recruiting that you've never accessed before when you're suddenly in this position that you haven't ridden in before. <laughs> it seems um, like you're speaking from experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, one time on one of the pro teams I was on, um, we kept time trial bikes in the trailer all year. So no opportunity to ride them otherwise. And then got them uh, during a stage race with a pretty heavy time cut enforcement for the time trial. And it was my first time riding it, building them in the driveway at, you know, midnight before the <laughs> stage. <Ideal>. And uh, <laughs> it was great. I did really well. I performed well. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> I had um, really bad, weird soreness, um, like glute and hamstring and lower back soreness, because all of a sudden I was in this position trying to race hard that I'd never been in before. And there is different muscle recruitment. And, um, I mean, when you're in a position like that and barring a bike that you haven't been on, trying to get comfortable and trying to understand the best position to be in and feel okay with the equipment can detract so much from the effort that you're trying to do that it's totally not it becomes not worth it at an extent. And something like this course at Gila where there is wind, there's a lot of downhill. Um, like if you go to the Gila website, the picture of a uh, previous winner is super tucking on his time trial bike. Like you carry so much speed on these. Is no, truly. Really, like, and that's illegal now. Not anyway, anymore. Right? Not anymore. <laughs> yeah. Can't but, super tuck anymore, right? <clears throat> no. Uh, yeah. But I mean, that speaks to how much speed you carry on these descents that aren't a super high, you know, it's not super steep descent, but on those time trial bikes with disc wheels and in those aero positions, you just get going so fast and start to spin out. And when you're carrying a bunch of speed like that and you're not familiar with the bike and have been riding for a year, um, that's a pretty asymmetrical risk for things to go sideways and be potentially dangerous. And, you know, if, you think that time trials aren't as dangerous as road racing because you're alone, like you're wrong, especially with stuff like wind and um, having really like high profile uh, wheels that really catch the wind a lot. And, um, you know, it's totally different. And I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend that Ryan do this, honestly, uh, <laughs> could could asymmetrically turn out pretty poorly for for him. And, you know, especially at a race like Gila. um you have to consider that the rest of the stages, there are just hours and hours of climbing. I'm not exaggerating, you know? And so you can really um, potentially injure yourself, uh, put yourself in a bad headspace, feeling weird and uneasy about this equipment when, um, you know, you're new to racing and so much can shake out on those other days. I wouldn't say like treat this as a rest day and don't worry about it. Um, you know, you might have to worry about time cut, but this isn't going to be the make or break moment um, for you in this stage race, I'm guessing. Uh, and could potentially have some really poor outcome if you borrow this bike that's, that sets you up to be in a bad position mentally and physically for the rest of the stage race. Mm. Nate, uh, what are your thoughts on, on this one, on, on the TT bike borrowing one or just doing the road bike? So what John said is with the time that is real with the same power output. I have never, you too. Have you ever seen someone jump on a TT bike and be able to put out the same power they can in the row position <laughs> without adaptation ever? Good point. No, no. Have you seen no. that, Ivy? No. no. Yeah. Some people it takes three, four, five months and with dedicated training only on that. And some people never like get it all the way there. So there's, mm -hmm. that's going to be an issue for sure. There's the soreness and stuff that Ivy said. Uh, it is don't, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then also the clip-ons, that's a whole... So if you have a bike that fits clip-ons, I mean, even just where your elbows are because your stem's going to be so far out, that's going to have its own issue with power and uh, how much, um, like how comfortable you are. And 
I would not do, and you could test this stuff if you wanted to at your own place. So if you're going to test it, what I would do is do, um, like two runs. See, you also to test it is so hard because you need to have a place with no wind and there's like the, the, the Chung method and all these things, but you could do something quick and dirty where you find some place that does not has, has no wind and you ride at a comfortable pace for you say 230 Watts and you do it with one with the clip ons and one without and see what kind of speed you're averaging inside of there with the same Watts. Again, it have to be pretty flat. That'd be really hard. And then another test you could do is with the clip ons on is you do an all out like 10 minute effort or 20 minute effort, probably 20 minute, which is hard to do. And then compare that to your road power. Cause I bet you money, what's going to happen is you're going to start close to your road FTP and then it's going to be, it's going to drop, 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 <laughs> which is another horrible way to race, uh, a TT is to start really right, John. Isn't that bad to start really hard? <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what you're talking about now, <laughs> <laughs> but what you can do though, there's a whole bunch of other things that you can do to get close to that same arrow benefit that you haven't talked about, but maybe you're doing, but I'm just going to go over it. We've gone on these many different times. Oh, before I get into that two on the TT bike, does that TT bike have a power meter? That's going to be huge because if it doesn't, maybe the pacing, um, this is long enough one where the, the power meter would save you more time. And two, is it the same power meter? Cause we know power meters can be off. Like I love a hot power meter, but if you <laughs> jump from a hot one to a cold one, that also ruins your TT as you're like, what is 30 Watts lower or 15 Watts lower, even 10. Like this is a long enough race where 10 Watts, if you're not used to it and you could try to, I'm going to switch my power meter. And if it's not pedal based, that's going to be its own like mechanical issues. John, you want to say something? Yes. Um, I was just going to say, uh, even if you don't have a power meter, assume that your RPE meter is going to be broken too. When you get onto this bike, like, uh, I don't know about you, all of you, but, uh, when I get onto the TT bike and if I'm riding at my road bike power, it's like, everything is different in terms of how I perceive things too. Like everything just feels more uncomfortable in different ways. And that causes me to lose track of what the effort is actually feeling like it's really hard. So it's, it's not even just a power meter thing, but you should assume that all measures of your effort are going to be off like different, you know, because you do that. It's tricky. And then race day too, it has its own craziness. Yeah. And then with caffeine <laughs> and all that. So here's, I'm going to run through it real, what you should do. Uh, arrow helmet. Okay. You can, you can do a TT arrow helmet. Uh, you can borrow one of those. That's okay. Skin suit. That's going to be the biggest one. If you do not have a tight fitting Jersey, get a skin suit. That's where you're going to save the most money wheels. I would not buy wheels for this, but just borrow wheels. You get a friend with some, uh, deep wheels, do that shoe covers, probably the cheapest. Yeah. Ivy. So really quick on wheels. Um, if it's super cross windy and you're trying to stay arrow and, and you feel like that might make you feel uneasy, uh, switch out the front wheel first, um, do a lower, pro lower profile on the front wheel first. That's what catches wind and makes you unstable. Um, sorry, keep going. Nate. Yeah. And it too, it depends on the brand and stuff. Uh, also though, if you're going fast enough on this downhill where you're super tucking that I'm in my mind, you're over 40, 50 miles per hour. And if there's a crosswind, uh, I'm going to want probably nothing deeper than a 50. And I mean, yeah. I love the envies, but the, the envies I've never had the push. I had some older, I mean, this is, you know, back in 2009, some zips, 808s, yeah. man, I got like, I did a Tossed. Vegas triathlon. <laughs> oh, I've never been, it's like someone grabbed my front wheel and just shook it, uh, yeah. on the TT bike. That was scary. Of course that's, you know, arrows, um, zips, not like that anymore, but, uh, it is wild how like depth isn't as crucial as like the shape of it and how it interfaces with the tire. And cause I think that what it really comes down to is how much pressure it applies to the front, like to the side of the wheel on the side of the wheel, how much mm -hmm. pressure it applies to the front versus the back. And when a brand can balance that out when there's pressure coming at it from the side, that's when it doesn't make your bike so unstable. Um, and I know that we probably sound like an envy ad, but I absolutely have had the best crosswind performance with their wheels. I bet there's other ones that I out there that I haven't tried, but it's really impressive. Like, um, and it's so scary when you have something that isn't like that. Oh, and it's like ta tearing the bars at your hands. It feels like so. This is a big enough race to do a chain, uh, ice friction. You can buy a wax so chain. They do it all for you. It's so hard to do right by yourself, but their chains are really good. It's going to be a dry race. I think putting an ice friction chain on would be amazing. Uh, tires. If you really wanted to go crazy, you could do like TT specific tires. I like the Corsa. What are they called? The Corsa speed plus Victoria Corsa speed plus. Yeah. Those things are like paper, but they roll so fast so much so <laughs> that when you try them, uh, 
I, I can feel the difference. Is that all in my head, John? Oh, yeah. Do you feel a difference? A hundred percent. Like, I don't know. Maybe we're just like, you know, obsessed with placebos or something, but I'm, I've True. tried myself on being pretty in tune with these sort of things and I can notice a difference. Those tires are very fast. I don't run them because they scare me. Um, but if for a <laughs> TT, oh, that's like perfect. That's when I would do it. So I ran them in crits too, because you had the wheel pit. So it's not a big deal, but on a road race, I wouldn't run them. Uh, but a TT, yeah, probably. Uh, and then your tire pressure, dial that in and there's stuff online. So do those things. That's going to get you, I mean, right there, that can literally get you like 30 Watts with mm -hmm. the skin suit, arrow helmet, wheels, shoe cover chain. And you take the wheels out. That's the most expensive thing. You can still probably get pretty close to that. Uh, you also said about, um, just slam the seat forward. If you push the seat forward, you also have to make the seat go up to get the same, uh, length between the bottom bracket and where your sit phones are. So make sure that you do that. Cause if you just push it forward, you're going to be really low and your quads are going to burn, burn, burn. And Ivy, you brought up um, a good point on that too. Since this is a UCI race, that might be illegal, right? To just slam it, quote, slam it forward. Right. And I don't know, um, you know, there will be UCI officials putting bikes on the jig for the UCI races, of course. But so I don't know if they enforce it for the lower categories, actually. Yeah, but, that's a good um, point. Yeah, I'm not sure. It would probably be hard to get the saddle forward enough to be on a road bike because of the, the C2 angle. But I wonder about the tips of the bars because you have that stem, that'd be uh -huh. something to check. And it'd be such a shame to roll up and then say, no, maybe they let you take it off, but I bet they'd yeah. start your time. Uh, so anyways, I would, when you push the angle, when you push the seat forward, that's supposed to open up your hip angle. But I've had actually a pretty bad time with it going forward because of my femur length. And sometimes, you put on more power with the back and still be folded over. And I remember there was a NorCal racer. Who's the guy with like the 480 FTP? Uh, Brennan. Uh, Brennan, Brennan Wirtz. I saw him at, I think it was at a race, a couple races, use a, uh, a road bike with aero bars and just destroy. I mean, he's got a huge <laughs> FTP, yeah. but I think he did that because he, I think he told me he put out more power with that way. And eventually he got his TT bike dialed in, but he had, you know, he has domestic pro level support and it took him a long time. Yeah, for sure. I, I look at this and I just think, just run your road bike. Uh, if you want to put the extensions on, you can, but all the same things apply because that's a foreign position. Just because it's your road bike doesn't mean that you'll be able to put the extensions on and feel comfortable. It's a totally foreign position. And there's a lot of different things that people don't take into account. How narrow are your elbows going to be? And is that going to then cause a huge amount of tension through your back and neck, cause you to lose power? Uh, and then in addition to that, increase soreness. There's just like a lot of variables. And if instead you just focused on putting out the best power that you could on your road bike, in many cases, you might be faster. So this best bike split data, like Nate said, it's normalized for the same power output. Uh, that's, that's assuming a really big thing. That's likely not going to be the case for you. So even though it looks like the TT bike is going to be two minutes and potentially 57 seconds faster, it probably isn't going to be that much faster because you're just going to be in that totally foreign position. And who knows, you might actually be like, like aerodynamics are weird. Sometimes you get onto a TT bike and your CDA actually might not be that good just because things aren't designed or like set up in a way to actually make you aerodynamic on your bike. Everybody's a little bit different. It's quite complicated. So Ryan, here's what you do. You run it with your road bike. And then afterwards you tell everybody I was going to be two minutes and 53 seconds faster. If I had a TT bike, <laughs> like all y'all, this is where I would have been if I would have had the equipment that you had. Um, but also we should cover the fastest position to be on the road bike, which is you put your, um, hands on the hoods and you make your elbows, like your arms parallel. You've seen them doing the tour all the time. It's not actually in the drops and Puppy it's not, paws? you know, sitting in. Can't do puppy paws. Puppy paws is like hands over the center and draped over the, t like your forearms are resting on the mm. top and then oh, your I hands puppy are. puppy paws was just like wrapping your hands over the hoods. <sighs> no, that's, oh. I, but, but that's, that's ideally that's the, what you want to do is that yeah. exact position, right? So <laughs> we have it on our um, Instagram. We have a, a visual of this so you can see it. And this has yes. been tested many times in different wind tunnels. And that is the fastest. Although I find that extremely tiring on my um, triceps. I don't know how the pros do it for so long. And they have like little, you know, Extremely small <laughs> arms, <laughs> <laughs> which then at that point you end up when it gets tiring on your triceps, you end up lifting up to straighten up your arms to take the strain off those, off the muscles and they're bent. And you might nullify the effect, like the beneficial effect from it. You know, it's like, um, I've heard it said before that the most aerodynamic position is the one that you can hold uh, the best. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that's like a, a big factor to consider is like, 
you know, we talk about don't do anything different on race day. Getting a completely different bike is something very big that you were doing different on race day, but also just assuming a totally new position is, is profoundly different. You know? Ryan, if you that, want to train, for, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to give Ryan an action item, uh, before the race. Uh, I assume you're going to go to Gila at least a day early, maybe a couple of days early. Um, if you ride that course easy, like super chill, slow to, uh, do your little shakeout ride the day before the first stage. If you do it really slow, it'll be an hour at most. And that's a really good opportunity to try your clip on bars on your road bike, try out some different positions. If you want to bring the time trial bike and see how it feels and works, maybe, um, sounds like, feels like we're all not recommending that, but <laughs> use that those days before to go slow ride the course. And especially when you're asking, you know, uh, overall, what percentage of FTP would I target for 40 minutes? I want to point out that this is not a, should not be approached as a 40 minute effort. When you look at the profile of the course, um, it's very unique in that there won't be, those descents aren't moments of rest, but there are different efforts that you have to segment between the, the climbs and the false flats and actual descents and steeper pitches that are really, really short before the turnaround. Um, and so pre-riding, a day or two before super chill, it just gives you a better idea of how to pace it, um, where your strengths are going to be on the course and what equipment you're comfortable with and how you want to ride it. Ryan, That's if it. you want to train for the TT right now on the trainer or outside that position, we talked about the puppy paws, practice that a bunch during your intervals, not just on the easy, I mean, you do the easy stuff too, but practice it under power. And also, especially on the trainer, even that position can cut off a bunch of Watts. And if you can't hold your power, you're either gonna have to pick a lower power target and do that same position or change your position up a little bit. I think we've seen this two people in the drops can't put as much power out as on the hoods. Um, that's a, that's something you have to keep in mind. And you can, that one though, I see people train that up a lot closer, a lot faster than a TT bike. Mm -hmm. You two also agreed. Oh yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. I've noticed that. I mean, uh, Pete even sets up his bike that way intentionally beforehand, right? So that he just knows that he's going to use the tops and that's where he's going to be. And that's, uh, how it's all set up. So, uh, Ryan, good luck at Gila. It's exciting. Let us know how you do. That'd be great. And everybody that's watching in the comments, if you want to send Ryan, good luck, you should, you should get dropping some comment love on YouTube. So, uh, Jeff says, I've thanked you before and I'll do it again. You're the very best. Thank you. I have a question that I can't recall being answered explicitly on the podcast. Understanding that consistency is likely the ideal target for daily training with two kids and a demanding job that isn't always possible. I frequently find myself taking what I can get, meaning I end up finishing a workout at 7 PM and waking up the next day at 5 30 AM to try and knock out the following day's workout. Unsurprisingly, the early morning after an evening effort does not go so well. Is there anything I should be doing on an ad hoc basis to modify back-to-back -back workouts? I'm not necessarily failing the, the efforts. I have just not very much, but I do feel like I'm accumulating more fatigue this way. So should I be pulling down the percentage of certain amounts or just grinding through and hoping for the best? Thanks again from Jeff. Uh, I wanted to quickly compare this to double days and then get into like, um, thoughts on on what Jeff could do in his specific case with like making the adjustments and then in general, what we can all do to increase consistency. Cause Jeff wisely recognized that consistency is what matters most. Um, so firstly though, in most cases, Jeff is probably working out with two times within like 24 hours, right? Kind of feels like a double day, but there's some key things to keep in mind with double days back at episode 167, I believe, or 187. Shoot. Um, we covered this episode, we covered this topic. And when we covered it, uh, we talked about double days and how, how they can be really helpful. However, they're only helpful if you are planning sufficient rest thereafter. Like you have to recognize that you're dosing your body with a lot of stress when you're doing two workouts within a 24 hour period. So then you need to be able to have extra time to rest thereafter. If you're just using it as normal time and it isn't very recuperative, it's a really good way to put yourself in a hole. In addition to that, it's typically, usually double days are paired in the context of doing like one sort of intense style training and then a less intense style uh, workout that you'll do thereafter spaced out by a certain amount of hours. Uh, in running, I know it's common these days in particular with like Jacob Ingerbitson and all these middle distance runners that are just insane. Um, I know it's common hearing like double threshold days and even like the Norwegian triathletes are talking about that. Uh, it's a very different context. And what they're doing there is they recognize that like 
when you run thresholds, cause they're doing insane volume with threshold training, cause they're the best athletes in the world. When they run threshold, their pace starts to drop off. Like you can only do so much uh, because running is such high impact and so difficult. And what their coaches want them to do is to be like, no, when you're running threshold, I want you to be running fast. So what they do is they do a session that's like half of what their actual desire is in terms of accumulated time and threshold. And they do the first part. And then later on in the day, like, you know, morning to evening, then they might do the second one. However, that's the best in the world. Uh, I've already seen a lot of athletes blowing themselves up, trying to do double threshold running. And on cycling, I've even seen some athletes doing this and it's not, it's not, uh, the same context. It's very different. And as a result, it changes the approach. So typically again, double days are like one hard workout, one easier workout within a 24 hour period. And they're offset by rest thereafter that allows you to absorb and adapt to all that training. But in this case, this is probably compromising Jeff's sleep, right? Like if Jeff is training late at night and then Jeff sleeps, but it's compromised and then gets up super early to then do another workout. So this is like compounding. It's like two hard workouts instead of a hard and an easy workout. And then it's likely also done on compromised sleep. So that's complicated. Like I, I could understand how this would make the morning workouts very difficult, but then also like over time, it could be really difficult. Um, so Nate, what would like practical suggestions in this case, I feel like Jeff might be trying to kind of fit it all in, like, uh, not miss a single workout and maybe even taking that approach of just hitting everything as is might be kind of setting him back. Yeah. What Jeff, what I would do is one, the back to back hard workouts. Uh, you don't need to do those. The only ones that we have that are sort of back to back hard are the, um, Saturday, Sunday, where the Sunday could either be a endurance ride or a sweet spot ride. And, uh, I think for you, if I'm going to do this, the sleep thing's a huge one at 7 PM. If, so if you have a, you have two choices, there's intense day and there's an endurance day on this. I don't want you doing intense, intense with this close amount of time between these two workouts. Um, even if it's the Saturday one, like cut down that, the other workout at night, the 7 PM one, you're going to do endurance. You're going to go less intensity and maybe even dial it down just a teeny bit. You're going to get some. You accumulate some TSS and, uh, some zone two work, but you're not going to ramp yourself up so much that that will impact your sleep. Then when you get up in the morning, the next day, you're not going to be totally thrashed from that previous, uh, workout, especially at that 7 PM, you're going to have carbs during that ride. And you're going to do recovery shake because even though you're going to say, Hey, it's just so easy. What you're going to do is you're going to prime your muscles, um, get some, you know, more glycogen in them for that morning workout. So that one's more successful. And if you didn't have the 24 hours between the two, you wouldn't have to do this. Or if you had 24 hours, you wouldn't have to do this, but because you don't, you're going to do that. Uh, and then in the morning, you're going to slam some caffeine. If you if you do that, uh, normal stuff. And right before the ride, you're going to do, I'm telling him exactly to do this time. You're gonna <laughs> like some raisin bread, some white bread with honey and toast you know, like 30 minutes before, 20 minutes before, or you could do a gel. It's going to be really hard to replenish, uh, liver glycogen, uh, that early in the morning where you would do like normal, like a three hour, uh, a meal, but three hours before. So you're going to do something really quick and easy before and then have some sports drink on the bike. And that is going to help a whole bunch. If that other 7 PM ride is really long, I would reduce it. Cause again, the sleep is going to be the important thing for keeping your consistency over time and your motivation and keeping these things productive. Cause the sleep too, is when you actually get faster, mm -hmm. you break yourself down and then you have to recover. Uh, those would be, I mean, if you, if you had to go the other way around, actually I wouldn't with that 5 30 yeah, AM, I wouldn't I would just, just switch them around that other way. And then that next day, I mean, I, I hear you on the schedule and uh, you might adjust it. So the next day could be hard, but as John said, because you know, you're gonna have three days off, right? I think we've all done that, right? You have a forced rest because of something and you do two hard back to back rides, which can, you know, it, it can be productive if you have the rest afterwards, but it's not advised to do it all the time. I know there's some shift workers and stuff who have to do this. Uh, but just as John said, think about the, the week going forward and the, the next sleep for the next day and the nutrition. Yeah. What, uh, Nate is saying about reducing to, um, reducing intensity or pick an alternate, um, I'm workout alternates hype man. Like, I love this. Mm -hmm. Um, when, you know, you have to do back to back ones. Um, if you don't really want to reduce the intensity, you can just pick a shorter duration and still hit the same 
zones and systems and feel like it's a little less taxing that way. And you could do that for both your 7 p.m. one and the 5.30 one if you want. You can even pick like an easier version of that workout as well, right, Ivy? Which is like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe because of the fatigue and because of the short sleep and everything else, maybe an achievable workout is better than a productive workout the next day in terms of actually kicking the can further down the road, like making you more fit long-term. Um, it's not always just strictly holding so tightly to like whatever is prescribed. And achievable meaning the same level or lower. And which is crazy is you can get faster doing achievable workouts. You don't always have to go forward on it because it's, um, uh, it's just the amount of training stress accumulated over a long period of time. Uh, it's, you want to unit faster if you do productive workouts, because that's actually pushing your system more, but achievable. Don't think achievable is a waste. It is a, a, a needed type of workout to have some days that are not, um, screaming hard, especially when you have other things stacked really closely and limited time to sleep. Jeff, uh, a bit of like a training audit for you to run through. If you aren't on a low volume plan, it sounds like it could be helpful in your case to do be on a low volume plan. So you have a day off in between each training day that you would do at least a day off, perhaps even two, uh, it sounds like it could be beneficial. So consider that if you haven't, um, and then, yeah, uh, turning down the intensity is so underrated, like, and, and it's not utilized enough by a lot of athletes it's okay. And it's favorable to turn down the intensity. Nate, how many times do we see athletes because they couldn't hold whatever the power target was? They just like quit on the workout and they're just like, Oh, it was way too much. When if they would have turned it down three to 5%, even like, you know, a significant chunk like that would have been much easier, but you would have gotten quality work done. Like it's, it's a better, it's a better path than just, I can't hold whatever is the high bar. So I'm just going to quit, you know? And there's a, there's a time where you should just quit. Um, if you're doing VO two max and you turn it down, you know, so you're, Instead of 120, you're at like 105. You're not being productive, you're moving to something else. Same with threshold. If you're dropping that down in a sweet spot, I would just end the workout and rest. Uh, but if you're, you know, a two percenter can really have a huge impact on huge. getting through something. Also, just skipping a, uh, especially on like 3030s or something, skipping an interval, totally valid. It can, re if you skip the in the middle of like a 10 minute set, totally doable. And you'll, ha you'll have so much more time accumulated at VO2 max. You'll, get through more of the workout, but there's an ego thing. Sometimes you don't want to skip that one, but it's okay. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Jeff's whole point here though, which I love is that consistency is what Jeff is trying to drive. Like he's got this complex situation and then he's trying to do these two workouts and he's trying not to miss his workouts. So in this case, I kind of wanted to spend some time talking about consistency and things that you have done in your training to help make like to remove barriers to training and make it just an easier process and task to do. Ivy, what things have you done to be able to just make training more, dare I say like automatic, like it's just less barriers, less things stopping you. Uh, this is great because I have to reconcile with this all the time when I'm like, whoops, I have <laughs> less than two hours and a bunch of intervals. What do I do? And for me, um, route planning and thinking about where I can do those efforts can is the quickest thing to deter me from actually getting outside and training. Um, and, uh, or make, make me feel like I'm, it's not achievable and it's going to take too much time to find a route. So really like knowing where, okay, this climb is a good threshold climb. And I know that if I'm doing a threshold effort, it'll take me this long to get to the top. And it's a pretty safe road to do, to turn around and do repeats on. And, or, oh, this, this road is a really nice, super low false flat and it's good for sprints. And um, this road is great for 20 minute efforts and knowing what is in my periphery for um, rides that are like less than 90 minutes is so important to me because if I'm scheduled to work out that's longer than that and I know I just need to get the effort done knowing that I can do something close to home and just get the intervals done and cut out the rest is so important for consistency for me. Um, mm. Otherwise, it feels th like the ride is too long and it's too big and I blew it today and maybe I should just do like a really short spin. No, if you know those super short routes in your area, um, for getting outside and trying to be consistent. Um, it's really important to familiarize yourself with what works in your area. 
And I think this is like, uh, this is why, and Ivy, good point. Like I have like my short VO2, my long VO2, and then my longer intervals. And then I have my endurance routes and I have like those sort of things figured out. But I think this is why indoor training isn't on like, it's always paired with like bad weather, it seems like, but really it should be paired with convenience. And like, it makes it so that your training can be more consistent and you don't have to worry mm -hmm. about the variables that you might encounter. Like it's bad weather. Therefore I have to make sure that I have seven more pieces of kit that are clean and ready to go. Like I need my arm warmers and my vest and whatever else. Like it's, it's really easy for it to balloon. Whereas with indoor training, it just can be so controlled and so mm -hmm. easy to be able to knock out your workouts. It's like a huge thing to upgrade your consistency with your training is just to always have that option that is immune in some respects of all those variables. It's huge, hugely helpful. Um, Nate, you've mentioned like a handful of things that you've done over the years, like little, like, uh, like efficiency gains in terms of outside of training or maybe during it, just to make it so that barriers are gone for you. What things have had the most help in making your training more consistent? I actually don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about something else. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> New feature. Just kidding. No. Um, so with, uh, if you haven't heard, I found out just like a year and a half ago, I have ADHD. And part of that's executive function is getting to do the thing. And looking back, there's so many times on a weekend where I want to ride, but I just don't ride. And the thinking about the riding, like if I would have ridden by the time that I started thinking about it, I would have been done. As soon as I get going, I'm good. But it's the actual act of starting. Um, and I know I'm not the only one out there that has probably felt this way. And the two things that I've learned that have helped is one, um, there's time urgency. So if there's an urgency to it, like you have to do something else at a certain time, then you actually do get on my bike because I don't have all this free time to do it. But it's also another part of ADHD, which Ivy talked about is time blindness where you don't realize, oh my gosh, I only have 30 minutes left. So setting timers. But the other big one is, uh, is having another thing that you need to do that's way harder than the ride do you ever so you ever like yeah. for those with yeah. adhd people you need to do some task and you're like this time i'm going to clean my house you haven't cleaned your house for a while you don't want to but because you have a harder task to do cleaning the house is easy and you're like this yeah, is fine when taxes come up you're like actually i think cleaning the house ain't too bad like you know <laughs> <laughs> exactly so if um so the 5 30 a.m one that's pretty uh that's usually there's a time issue, right? Because that's why you're getting up so early. So if you don't start at this time, you can't go in. And that urgency really helps people with ADHD. Uh, but if you can also, you know, you know, you have to do something else that Saturday, but that's really hard. Getting on the bike is a good way to procrastinate the other thing. So that's a little life hack there. Uh, the other ones are just pre-mixing <laughs> bottles, you know, having your kit ready, you keep your bike all set up. And then I mix between upbeat music on the hard stuff and then uh, TV shows on the easy stuff. Yeah. I think you mentioned at one point, like that you wanted to even watch episodes of a show, but you were like, Nope, like I'm saving that for the trainer. And it was like a reward mm -hmm. that you attached to the training. Uh, for sure. and that's like a, a super, I found what I do on Netflix is I build up my, like the, my list thing on Netflix. I build that up with content that I want to watch on the trainer. And it makes it like, like right now, like we have the same people that did drive to survive. They're also, they've done like full swing, the golf one can't remember what the tennis one's called, but it's also fantastic. Like and I've been watching and those ones, I love watching them. And it's cool because they're typically somewhere around 45 minutes to an hour. So then it makes it so that like, like I had, uh, I had like a three hour workout on the trainer, uh, not long ago. And I was like, well, that's like three, almost four episodes of full swing. So I'm set. Like, it's a good way to think of it. It made it way less daunting and it made it more appealing. Cause I had paired like a reward and a stimulus mm -hmm. to the task. It's a really helpful thing that I found. And with dopamine, this is for everybody, but especially ADHD people, it needs to vary. If you do upbeat music every time, the, the amount of dopamine you get from that will actually be less. And sometimes doing it without it is good. Um, if you tried to do anything as like a reward like that, that you do every single time, the reward response will be less and less and less. So you have to have some times with either something different, variety, novelty is a big part that helps you with ADHD, or um, just doing some without anything and grinning through that will make the other ones easier. So maybe it's achievable and you're like, you know what, I'm just going to focus on my breathing and be internal. The next workout you have that's hard and use upbeat music is going to be way easier and uh, be more motivated. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, I have a handful of things that have helped me with consistency, making it so that my training just happens. Like I look back and I'm like, wow, I was so consistent with my training during that time. 
I wonder how I did that. And it's because of these things. So I'm going to read off the list because I don't want to miss them uh, for you all. But no plan kids. your training. Just kidding. <laughs> like, no, just kidding. Step one, don't have kids. <laughs> That's true. Good point, Nate. <laughs> um, uh, number one, plan your training for as early as possible in your day. And there's this is a double-edged sword because it might be really tough to train in the mornings. But what I found for me is that that is a lesser evil than the chaos and dependencies of my day will make it so that if I say, oh, I'll train in the evening, my evening might fill up because unexpected meetings or unexpected things will pop up. And then that ends up pushing everything later. If you do the training first, then there's less chance of things getting in the way. So that's one. Number two, plan your training time on your calendar, even though it seems really simple. Like if you have meetings and you have everything else on your calendar, why not have your training on there? If you do that, it's going to be easier to keep that time sacred, so to speak, and make sure that it isn't tread upon by other things. Number three, communicate your, the, your training with, to the people in your life. This is hugely helpful, uh, for, for me, like I'll say, Hey, this is what I'm, these are the workouts that I'm doing this week. These are the context thing. I want to do this one outside. I want to do this one inside this one. I'm going to need like a, a lot of mental energy to be able to complete this one. This one's going to be really tough. And when I communicate that with my family, then that makes it easier. And even my coworkers, I'll communicate that with them. That makes it easier for all of us to be able to plan around it so that it doesn't get interfered with as well. So once again, just communicate it. Don't keep it to yourself. Plan your pre-training meal like it's the most important meal of the day. Many times we leave that for dinner or something else, but plan whatever. If it's like lunch that you're going to eat beforehand, make that the one that you put all of your focus on. Uh, so that makes it so that your nutrition is set up and you're not setting yourself up for failure or deprivation. Nate already mentioned this, but store your bike on your trainer. You don't have to like store it on the wall or put it on a hook or just lean it against the wall. You might as well just put it on your trainer. That way, if you do need to do your workout, it's one less thing that you have to do, uh, getting to your workout. They make great bike stands. They don't fall over. Uh, it's quite handy. <laughs> so I uh, recommended then, uh, if you have a wheel off trainer with erg mode, that's two things that cut out the potential. Like you don't have to worry about flats. If you have a flat front, you can just ride it. The trainer with a flat front. It'll be okay. Don't do it long. Cause it'll hurt your tire. But you know, if you just do like a ride or something like that, it's okay. And also erg mode means that you can have dead shifters. If you have battery uh, powered shifters and you don't even have to worry about it as well. So that's two barriers that commonly get in the way of rides that you've eliminated. And then the one last thing that I've done is I've had fans and like climate control and remote access. So whether you have like a Wi-Fi enabled outlets or a little remote to be able to turn on fans or something else, you can cool off your training space beforehand or heat it up uh, beforehand, get it to whatever temperature you need. That makes it way easy too. Cause I find it really demotivating when I have to go out onto the trainer in the cold or something, or it's really hot, then that's going to discourage me to do it. So that's another like really big uh, tip is you can set up the environment to be all built around that. Uh, Ivy, I don't know if you have anything else to add before we move on to Jeremy's question. No, you nailed it. Cool. This one's going to uh, be a good one for you. It says for us mere mortals that are not able to pre-ride a race course, how do you make a plan for race day strategy when at best you might have a Strava file or other such data source? And for an added wrinkle, how do you plan for a race that you do every year, but the race director makes tweaks to it each year? So pre-riding without being able to act or reconning without being able to pre-ride Ivy, what do you do? Cause I'm sure that you face this. Well, you don't build expectations for the outcome of that race. That's for sure. <laughs> and, you know, I wonder what kind of race Jeremy is talking about. Is it a time trial? Is it an enduro? Is it, um, you know, an XC well, race? Is it a road race? Enduro. <laughs> <laughs> that's, no, totally. that's scary. <laughs> uh, and I mean, if the race director is changing it every year, then, you know, you can probably safely assume that most other racers are in the same position. Um, and mass start races, you know, has so much to do with the vibe of the field anyways. Um, you can make a plan of what you want to focus on. Um, you know, if you want to try to get an early break or force an early break or conserve for the sprint at the end, or look at the, uh, course outline and know that there's one big climb and try to do something there, you know, um, you have to look at these races where you don't know what to expect in terms of the course as a learning opportunity and um, not a results opportunity. And even when we know the course really well, that doesn't mean that we know what the outcome will be on race day, right? Um, there could be a change in weather. Um, there could be a change in the race field dynamic that 
puts you on your toes in a different way, that you don't get to ride the course in the way that you wanted to and are planned on riding. And so there's probably something valuable in that, that even if you know the course and know how you want to ride it, doesn't mean that you get to ride it that way on race day. Um, Mm. So thinking on your toes is the best way to approach race scenarios like this. And um, maybe even when you know the course really well. Ivy, how much do you like, do you actually need to Unless it's a, like a cross country or above for technicality, because cyclocross you can always pre ride, crate you can always pre ride. When like, do you really pre ride road races though, or just look at like the Strava file? No, almost never. I mean, un- it's unless so it's a circuit. Um, but it, but if it's a circuit, you know, uh, then I use the first lap up. to get an idea yeah. of oh, what yeah. the course <laughs> is like. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, but especially, I have done races where um, if it's a really long road race and there's a significant section or climb will go, we'll go drive it. So you don't, um, use a bunch of your energy pre-riding it. Um, but no, like most of these road races, uh, a lot of people don't get to ever pre-ride them. And you can ask other racers who have done it before what they feel about it and think about it, but that can be really dangerous too, because, um, one climb or feature or course can feel really different to, um, a climber than it does to me. And, you know, I see a lot of racers do something like this that are in an elite field and show up for the races at two or three o'clock in the afternoon. And they ask the early categories like, Hey, what's the course like? And those people that raced at, you know, 7am that it's their first six months of racing, their experience on the course is very, very different than the elite racer that's going in the afternoon. So (laughs) (laughs) none of that advice is applicable or relevant to them, you know? Um, what about the, what about on the road though? Do you, do you, what about the finish? Like how on road races, do you check out the finish when you can? Um, if you can, if that's what your plan is, I don't know how Jeremy is, is a rider, you know, are, is, are they, are they a climber? Like, are they trying to sprint? Um, is the finish, if the finish is totally flat and I know that it's going to be that way, or there are a couple turns, I'll look at that and know like, okay, this is standard. They're going to have 1K to go marked. They're going to have 500 meters marked. I know how to sprint. I know how to navigate a field. If it's going to be flat, all I have to worry about is the other bike racers. But if it is a decisive climb that's at the finish with maybe a weird profile that has some pitches or some weird turns, yes, you should try to go ride and check it out. Or um, those are the kind of finishes where... I try to be really conservative and let other people lead. Um, if it's a totally pan flat sprint finish, um, I know where I want to start sprinting and I will, if it's not moving quickly enough, like I will lead it out and take control. But if it's a uphill finish and I'm not sure what to expect, I will totally key off other riders and let them lead the way until I can see the finish and know exactly what it looks like. Um, and you have to wait until that moment to figure it out, you know? Um, but that's kind of just the way it goes when you don't get a preview of the course. Have you ever had it, both of you, where you're close to the end and you, somebody sprints off, you're like, wow, they're going early. And you realize it did not go early, but everyone <laughs> else thought the finish line was a lot farther away. And you're yeah. like, oh, that was the move. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. Yeah. I, that's yeah, happened sure. to me many <laughs> times. I, I recommend on these road mm-hmm. races, you see... I mean, if, if it's not wide open, like, you know, you, you ride the last three, four K to figure out where it is. Cause it, it can be, you know, there's one steep hill section in there. It's not on the Strava file. Cause it could be really short, like a minute. Um, yeah. other, other than that, I just look at the Strava file. Cause I, all I want to know are where the decisive moments are in terms of climbs. Um, and if there's anything like a weird descent or something, I want to see that, but all the other road races, it, they, they don't, the Strava file too, to me, never really shows you what it's going to be like. Do you guys <laughs> For do you sure. feel that way too? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, I feel like it undersells the impact of particularly our eyes fixate on the big climbs, like you said, Nate, but it's all like the little smaller undulating climbs and the rollers where oftentimes that's where like, oh geez, this is way harder than I thought to hold that speed. Uh, Ivy, how many times have you done a race where you feel like the one K to go or 500 meters to go or 250, whatever it is, isn't marked correctly. Yeah. Like, I feel like almost every race, (laughs) Yeah. you know? One thing that uh, I've done is looked at the finish and then I look for like a landmark, meaning like a tree or a, uh, some sort of infrastructure or something that's there. And I'm like, this is where I want to go from instead of trusting just the the numbers. And this is why you should do this in training all the time. 
every time I have a sprint workout, uh, I, I do look at time of course, but I will have a landmark, especially when I'm, um, like helping other riders and doing sprint clinic stuff, or I have a training buddy and want to go toe to toe with them. I'll say that speed limit sign or like that second tree up there. That's what we're sprinting for. And that is the best way to get very well acquainted with your sprint duration, uh, Mm. what you can hold and having a visual landmark for how far away it is so that when you're surprised by the finish or surprised by, uh, like when that 500 meter sign does not look like 500 meters, I can see the finish. Um, you know exactly what to expect of yourself and what you can do based upon where that finish line is. Good pro tip. That's a good one. Uh, it, cause that's also the hard part. I find, sometimes I find myself like, well, I know for 30 seconds, I should be able to put X amount of Watts, but how long is the sprint going to be? And really like it, if you can triangulate with the vision there and, and figure that out, it's, it's a, it's a big help. That, do you, but, do you guys look at the amount of Watts at the end? I, in a minute of a road race, I'm, I'm what do you just, mean? Like in, in a I don't sprint? look at my watch. Yeah. Oh, I just, no, I just go opinion. like, and I try to go actually the opposite where I, I try to peak and then fall to get that separation almost unless I'm, you know, I peak whatever the move is. So if you're drafted on somebody, but it's never an even effort. No, no. Yeah. And when I'm saying that I can know I can put out this much time, I'm just trying to figure out like, well, how long of a sprint is this going to be? And does that fall like Nate, you're really good at like one minute efforts, right? Like that's Mm -hmm. like where you're strongest. Whereas for me, I've got like a really good 15 to 20 second sprint on me, like really good. So in that case, I'm going to look at it and be like, well, if this course is going to have like a minute long drag up to the line, it's probably going to be really tough for me to beat somebody like Nate. And if that person's in my field, I'm going to have to adjust my tactics. You know, that, that was the best part is when I was doing well in races is I would, oh, it's too early, right? It's that minute one where, and two where everyone else is like, I'm waiting for the 15 second. I'm good uh-huh. at 15 <laughs> seconds. So I'm going to wait till someone pulls Nate back, uh, and Another one, if you have a teammate attacking off the front, John and I did this once. Uh, so if you're strung out, if you can, if, if you would just like switch with somebody, so let's say your, your, your teammate, we have a video on this, your teammates lead or making the field really fast in your second one. This is the lower categories. We don't have huge teams. Um, they go over and you take over. And then once you get in front and then you go and accelerate, you've got a one person barrier in between and that one bike length. The person, the next person, if they don't cover that and, and like go around that person quickly, you've suddenly got two, three bike lengths and they have to, the amount of power they have to do to keep up with you because of the extra wind resistance is going to be more than what you're going at. And if you're going at as high as you can, uh, you know, reasonably and within that minute, it's really hard for them to come back and, um, get in that draft because again, the longer it is and the bigger the space is, the more power they have to do to keep up with you relative to you. Mm-hmm. And you know, um, it's, it's exponential. So it's, uh, is it exponential? I don't know. It's a, it does not increase linearly. It's, def- it's not linear. Yeah. That's yeah. Linear. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So that's, yeah. that's a, it's a great tactic and it's really easy to execute is the other person just doesn't pedal. You got to keep pedaling, but don't pedal. Um, cause if you stop pedaling, everyone's going to come around you but don't like, uh, don't keep up with the person. Let that gap happen. That's a good tip. I, I feel like with road racing, Ivy kind of way to sum up, uh, like the things you said with road racing, you're racing a field. If it's a time trial, it's one thing to like, you know, figure out the profile and figure out your power targets in relation to the profile. But with road racing, you're racing people. That's like the point. And so as a result, it's more, pay, more important to pay attention to the race. Sure. You don't want to go in like totally blind. Like you can look at that file beforehand. So you have an idea of the length or maybe some key things, but in the end, it's all about how you react to the people mm-hmm. that you're racing with. Yeah. And you could find yourself in, in a break in a, during the moment that you thought was going to be a really hard climb or something that you thought was going to totally take it out of you. You could be in a break and the people in that break could maybe want to take it easy because they have a really comfortable sizable gap and they would rather leave it to a sprint. And that feature that you thought was going to be, you know, the moment that you had to focus on or could potentially do you in was totally chill. You know, it really does depend Mm -hmm. so much upon, uh, what the group dynamic is and what other writers are trying to do. And it can, 
totally make your plan. It's kind of the reason why making a race plan is a bit of a fool's errand. You can focus on things that you want to get out of the race or that you want to try to make happen, like forcing a move or waiting for the sprint, but ultimately you're not in control. Ivy, at the end of a race, how do you balance the difference between like what your plan is and what you're good at and how it's unfolding? Like how much weight do you put on what you're planning, what you're good at? And how much do you just like reading the race and seeing opportunities live and making like that really quick decision? Um, I mean, I think they fold into one another, right? So making a plan and knowing what you're good at has to also go into reading the race. So if I see a break going that I know, oh my God, all these people are really strong riders. They're all going to be there at the finish and there's five of them. Um, you can't be like, I'm good at sprinting. I have to conserve and wait. And this is my plan. <laughs> I have to stick to my plan. You have to go, you know? Um, so there are elements of both and it just takes so much practice and knowing yourself and practicing these things and training, uh, to know how to capitalize on your abilities based upon what the other writers are doing. It just takes time. Have you? And takes noticed? messing up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> a lot. Well, and if most of it is just putting yourself in that, in the position to gain that experience, right? Ivy. And if you're just purely sticking to the game plan, no matter what, regardless of what people are doing, you're not going to be in the right position to make those or to gain that learning. Like you have to, you have to be in the game to be able to get mm -hmm. all the learnings from it. Have I you know. noticed like a Dunning Kruger effect with, um, key moments in races based on the profile of the course? and how a field races it. What I'm getting at here is that like in the lower categories, that big climb does seem to really separate the wheat from the chaff. And in like P12, it also seems to separate the wheat from the chaff. And it's probably because you have like these just really like big variances in, in ability levels and in Watt KGE, that sort of stuff. But then in the middle categories, I often find that the moves happen when you least expect them. And like that key moment, or you, that big climb or something actually doesn't end up being that decisive. And instead it's this like little benign moment that you never would have guessed. This would have been the time when a break would go. Um, and I wonder how much of that is just because of like that lag of learning where everyone's like still hasn't figured out that it's like on the decisive moments. And then the fact that you have maybe more compressed fitness levels, but I really found that like at first I was like, Oh, the big climb is where everything's going to happen. And sure. That's what it was like. And then no longer did that happen. Instead, you had to be really heads up in those middle category races because anything could happen at any point and get left behind. So I've seen that. It's good advice. I, yeah. I have another, I have a theory. I just thought of that mm -hmm. in the lower categories, it like going earlier is usually better in the upper categories. Like it's like the last person to go with the teams. It's like the, cause it's going uh -huh. so fast. It's that like lead out train where in the lower categories, somebody jumps just a little bit earlier than what they see. Like the pros do, or like, you're going to lead me out. Somebody jumps a little bit earlier, especially from a back to the front. Cause the speed's usually slower, right? On the lower uh -huh. categories, that athlete is the right, or is the, the one that usually jumps the field and wins. Yeah. Have y'all noticed that? I mean, both of you like race low categories for like three days. So I don't remember. <laughs> no, <laughs> Back in that's 92. not true. <laughs> no. I was, no, I was the worst bike racer you've ever seen for the first couple of years. I'm serious. Wow. Like talking the last, last person, the Finnish cab four races. So Comforted depressing. <laughs> and you still stuck why. with it though. I, yeah, yeah. I don't know why. Cause I was not having fun. <laughs> so sad. It was in your blood, Ivy. You couldn't get it out. So. <laughs> yeah. I have noticed yeah. that, Nate. And, and you too, Ivy? Yeah, you're, I feel like you, uh, when you writers that can do that are also keying off the inexperience. Um, maybe it's negligible; mm -hmm. they don't know they're doing it. But when you do that, you're keying off, uh, you know, inexperience of the other riders in that field. And um, a cat one two would see someone jump early and foresee it happening and be on your wheel immediately. And you can really take lower category riders by surprise. They just don't know, you know, a little ex mm -hmm. inexperience in that regard. Oh, it takes nerves of steel. Like you see like really good racers and it's, it's like physically impressive, but it's also impressive how like much trust they had and confidence in their ability to just wait and wait and wait until like the time was right. And they have the skill to be able to pull that off. Um, like you said, Nate, I feel like for lower category racers waiting usually ends up in a worse result <laughs> oddly. Um, but at that higher category, it's just really impressive. They have like steel resolve, uh, to be able to hold on.
for the lower category racers, go on our YouTube, the race analysis, and there are, especially the earlier ones, um, the ones that I, I know, I know what Pete was, so what they are is their GoPro footage of races. The earlier ones are mine and Pete Morris would tell me what I could do to improve. And there are so many examples of front to back. Um, even I think one, the, the race, they were going like 15 miles per hour, the last lap to go, this is like a 35 plus four. And I just like, I drifted like 50 feet off the back and just spun it up as fast as I could with one lap to go. And it was a short lap. It was like a 45 second minute lap or something. And that was enough. And that's an extreme example. But, um, the other one that Pete says, I think all lots of bike workers know this, but as you're going and you're, you're in the back and you're already going fast, and then you see the field start to fan out, slowing down, then you, if there's a spot, you accelerate and you, that's when you start going really hard. Um, and then when you slingshot by everyone, that's great for a breakaway, but also if it's close to the finish and so many times in those other categories, especially there's not too many people, everyone's looking at each other and mm -hmm. th they think that they want to be the second one to go always. Um, yes. so they slow it down and they don't want to make it go fast. They don't have any teammates. And if they make it go fast, they're just going to be tired. Uh, mm -hmm. so that's where that slingshot works really well. Yeah. But it doesn't happen. P12, it doesn't happen because it, it goes 35 miles per hour and it never stops. Yeah, exactly. And if you're, if you're eight wheels <laughs> yeah. back, you, your only chance is to go back farther, not yeah. forward. <laughs> you can't get ahead. It just doesn't mm -hmm. work that way. So yeah, I, I guess recapping on the re on the you can't pre-ride the course. You're racing people. You're not racing the course. Uh, so you don't have to worry about it as much. Uh, it Sure, look at the Strava file, find some landmarks, get acquainted with it. But it sounds like with Ivy's advice is don't stick so firmly to the plan that you miss the people that you're actually racing and you got to go with those moves. So no stress. And also maybe a really good thing, right? Ivy is that chances are in this case, this athlete's far from the only one that feels like they're in a situation where they haven't re pre rode the course. So don't mm -hmm. worry, you're not alone. Um, I often realize that I build myself up to be the only person that's suffering some sort of inconvenience and it's not the case. <laughs> you know, everybody is dealing with it. So, uh, okay. Marshall's question. This is a really good one. Um, it's really about like whether you should get your PRs from training or racing. There's kind of like two theoretical different perspectives on this. Uh, Marshall says, what's up trainer road team. I appreciate all that you do. Uh, you constantly put out high quality content and an excellent training platform. We appreciate it. Thanks Marshall. Uh, go to trainerroad.com and sign up if you haven't to go check it out. I'm waiting to try and figure out where to sprinkle in some all out efforts going after a KOM, for example, or trying to hit a PR on a local hill or loop on a low volume plan. I'm currently on a low volume plan, but often end up riding six to 10 hours a week total in order to try and meet the objective of the plan. I try to make the additional, uh, uh, hours, either Z2 or quote soul rides. Amazing how those two overlap so often though. <laughs> so, uh, make sure you're being honest with it in your mind. Um, meaning riding for the fun of it with friends or a group ride, et cetera. Outside of the occasional group ride, I rarely go hard as I'm trying to stick to the plan and make sure I can hit the week's workouts as prescribed. Well done, Marshall. Got to prioritize the work. So my question stems from the fact that I have noticed on the rare occasions when I go all out, that's when I hit my PRs for one minute, five minute, 20 minute, et cetera. Is this almost always, or this is almost always outside of a trainer road workout. It seems like the program currently use only uses data to, uh, data from your workouts to calculate your FTP, which is actually incorrect. Uh, Marshall, it's looking at the work that you do outside as well. And it's considering that. And that's why AI FTP detection is so incredible because you don't just need to do a specific effort or do it inside. It looks at all of your riding. Nate. Any of your cycling rides with um, power meter, or if you have even some with a heart rate, there's some stuff that happens in there with the other power meter. Oh, you wouldn't want all your outside riding to be with just heart rate, but if occasionally happens in there where your heart rate monitor, if you don't have a power meter on one of your bikes, and that will also help improve the accuracy. Yep, absolutely. So <clears throat> it is looking at those efforts for you. Um, Am I limiting my rate of growth by sticking strictly to the numbers? Uh, I do understand that the intention of the platform is pro to progressively overload and that frequent all out efforts may put me in a hole that could ultimately be counterproductive. Well said. However, whenever I go on YouTube and see some of the quote elites going all, all out way more often than I am, I have to ask if I'm not leaving a bit of meat on the bone. And yes, I understand that I'm not one of the elites and should not uh, train like them. Thanks again for Marshall. Also keep in mind, Marshall does just consistent knocking out the marks. Does that make entertaining YouTube content or do all out efforts make entertaining YouTube content? So don't think that what you're seeing is reality and representative of the whole picture or even the best way to train. Uh, it's always a really tricky thing. So, uh, 
Okay, there's a lot to unpack here uh, where we can get into on whether it's best to do these all out efforts or not. Um, first of all, yes, Trainer Road is picking up on those outside efforts, so that's a good thing. Um, but this question, uh, am I limiting my rate of growth by st sticking strictly to the numbers? Nate, maybe it was you that said this, or maybe it was somebody else, maybe on one of the Kona podcasts that we talked about, but we talked about how triathletes in many cases, like long and distance triathletes that maybe not are following trainer road plans or anything else, but they just ride like Ironman pace all the time. And so they may not know what they're capable of. Like when you ask them what their sprint is, you know, they, they may not even know what their sprint is because they just don't work on it ever. And this whole concept in this, that I'm limiting my growth by just sticking strictly to the numbers. I think this is different than that circumstance, but yeah, like all out efforts, they do have their place, right? Nate, it's just all strategic. Uh, yeah. I, so when you're training on a trainer road workout, it, it's probably going to be bad. If like we're doing one minute repeats, you're going to have 12 of them. If you hit a PR in that, we'd have 12 PRs. Like that would be impossible. You couldn't do yeah. it. And the whole point of intervals is that you get to the pace that is challenging, but repeatable. And at the end of that workout, maybe you can do, you could have done one or two or like, you know, a 10, 20% more. You couldn't do a lot. And hopefully you're not gassed to the point where, you know, even one more, although that happens sometimes and you want to back it off a little bit. So that's why it doesn't happen in workouts. It's just like, think about weight training. Um, if you're in the gym and you're with 15 weights and you're like, Hey, I've never hit, let's say you're a bodybuilder, right? You're trying to get bigger muscles. You're like, I never hit my one rep max on these things. Do I need to hit my one rep max? Because that is a whole thing, right? That's going to gas you for the rest of the workout. And if one rep max, if you're power lifter, you're going to be doing that. You're going to be doing one rep max for sure. Um, but if you're a bodybuilder, you probably, you could calculate it. You don't really need to hit it. Uh, and in, in this, in these, with this sort of like you, as a bodybuilder too, you're going to get bigger by doing more consistent, the reps, the sets, lots of hard sets, things like that. Um, so in your workouts, you can, you're definitely not holding yourself back by not doing these PR all out efforts, but those are super fun, especially on Strava. And sometimes they'll happen naturally in a race. Um, and on, I mean, having a, a Strava day where you try to hit these and really like a one minute effort, you're said that's going to gas a one minute effort, a five minute effort, or even one 20 minute effort isn't going to gas you any more than a workout. And a lot of times it's going to gas you a lot less. Um, uh, you could do a one and a five, probably and a 20 in the same workout and the same ride and be okay. Uh, mm -hmm. two days from then, depending on, you know, sleep and all that sort of stuff. So I would, I don't, you ever do y'all ever do a Strava KOM day? Like where you try oh. to specifically get, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't get as many as I used to though. People are faster and I'm slower, <laughs> but Ivy, do, where do you see your PRs? Like most of them from racing, I would assume not from training. I'm totally. Yeah. Or race rides. Um, and I'm trying to think of a way to help this make sense to this athlete. Um, it's like, it feels like saying, uh, I don't. I don't win any races in training. Well, yeah, you, that's not what it's for. And you trained so that you could win races, you know? Um, it's yeah. I don't know. You guys are covering it. You're nailing. <laughs> yeah. Cause this is, uh, but this is common. You see a lot of athletes like really try to, they, they want to see their biggest numbers in their training. Right. And, and what they do is they'll like overshoot their goals or they're always pick a harder workout. And chronically what happens if you do that regularly is it just leads to fatigue. Like if you're always trying to every workout, you need a sign that it's working and that sign is a PR. And if you're doing that, it's going to lead you to a point where you're just going to be overtraining. Um, yeah. that's not how you get faster long-term, right? Short-term you might get like a, a, a boost and an increase from doing these like hard, really hard efforts. But an ideal training plan is going to give you those, give you hard efforts strategically at the right time. Um, and it's really all about setting yourself up to be able to PR when it matters more than just on mm -hmm. your training days. You know? Another really cool feature that we have, we, I guess another video we could do is, um, seasons on PRs because oftentimes probably John and I both, we're probably, if you look at our all time PRs, we might never hit those again in our lifetime because <laughs> yeah. we were so excellent and fast. Ivy, your best days are still ahead of you. <laughs> as a, but just yeah, for a yeah. slow decline Keep talking about of, how excellent of, and fast we were, Nate. I like that. Of That's age. Yeah, please. Uh, I'm 41 now and it's going to be, I mean, it's still possible, but uh, it just gets harder as you get older. And what seasons do is you can say, okay, for this year, if I, if I started training 
we use January 1st as a day. You could, well, I don't want to use that one because that'd be the year. Let's say I start training in March for cyclocross. And I say March 1st is the beginning of my season is it will track your PRs all relative to March 1st. So as you go through, um, you will actually get PRs and a lot of workouts in that way. And you can constantly see yourself getting fitter as you go through without having to do those really all out efforts. And if you do do an all out effort, you can kind of see, you can track yourself over time within that season. Um, and if you're racing a lot, let's say you did some road races and stuff, which is, you know, where you're going to get your PRs is in the races usually, or Strava Hills, Strava, Strava segments, you'll see them increase over time. And that is also, it feels really good. Um, AI FTP detection is also excellent way to see yourself getting faster. Combine that with progression levels. And it is a tangible amount that, hey, if I can do um, the repeated intervals in training, Dr. Andrew Coggin or Alex, I forget his name, they talk about the seven deadly sins of FTP testing. And that is the, the the second highest accuracy that they say is the repeated intervals you can do in training. The highest they say is like a well-paced, you know, long effort, which I can't do. And I've been doing this for like, I don't know, 13, 14, 15 years. Like, <laughs> I don't think I've ever paced yeah. it properly to my full capacity. Uh, that That's a really cool feature. And then with season match, you can compare season to season, which is also really cool. So you could say, how am I tracking this cyclocross season versus last year's cyclocross season or last year's road season like uh 16 weeks into my year am i faster or into my season am i faster this season than i was 16 weeks into last season because how often i forgot what we wrote this feature how often do y'all get your prs at your a race which you tape yeah. for and then they're just You're like giant gonna numbers see them again until and you get <laughs> no prs the race. whole time and it's hard <laughs> to track against your uh your prs against the previous season uh without doing like a spreadsheet yeah I do want to answer Marshall's question. Uh, the first have question, to. Figure, out, <laughs> <laughs> figure out where to sprinkle in some all out efforts after, or like going after a KOM or trying to hit a PR on a local hill or loop while on a low volume plan. Marshall, if you're on a low volume plan, there's probably a reason like your life is demanding or uh, personal life is demanding. And so don't fall into a trap of on those when you're able to get out for those soul rides or weekend rides you can't do this every week. Um, don't do it every single week. Um, and if you find yourself wanting to, or you do on accident on these group rides or these soul rides, you have to stay on top of recovery and nutrition if you find it being a regular thing. Um, but don't, I, uh, seeking out, trying to get a PR every single week, um, or even every other week, uh, when you're also doing low volume, um, there's a reason why you're doing low volume and you need to keep yourself in check and make sure that you're allowing yourself recovery and, uh, to keep building in a way that in a progression that makes sense so that you can keep getting faster and not just plateau or even dig yourself into a hole. I have a great time to work these in for Marshall, and that would be at the end of your loading phase. So if you notice in most of our plans, if you're in the base phase, uh, it might give you five weeks of more gradual loading and then a deload week. But in the build and specialty phases, it's going to be three weeks of loading and then one week of deloading. We call that a recovery week. And a great time to do this is at the end of your loading phase. So like just before the recovery week, give on the, on a Saturday or something like that, whatever the day is, make that your KOM day or make that like your, your, your like power PR day where you're going to go do it because you know that you have this week where it's going to be lower intensity thereafter. It's probably the safest time to be able to work it in. And it's kind of fun because then it gives you a carrot to chase and something to look forward to at the end of your build phase. Um, that's something that I've done and it's like been really helpful. There's a ton of short KOMs, uh, nearby. And, and one of my friends has like all the KOMs. He's just a beast with short efforts. And I want to do that at the end of like the sessions. I want to do that or at the end of the loading phases, I'm going to go out and I'm going to make it so that like I go and try to take three KOMs on like each day that I go out and, and do it. So that's a, a fine way to uh, put it in. If you are going to, the, the, I guess the biggest principle to follow is the fact that like, understand that if you work harder, it's going to require more recovery. So pace or position things appropriately in that regard. Uh, if you don't let it compromise the training, Make sure that you hit your workouts. And then if you have particularly stressful times in life, that's probably not the best time to go chase a bunch of KOMs or do something hard that throws you into a, a hole. Um, so those would be this my is, recommendations there. On Marshall though, he's got six to 10 hours of riding and he's on a low volume plan, which is like three and a half to four hours. To me, I'm going to recommend something. Yeah. That we usually don't recommend is at the end of those intervals, 
like go all out on that last one or do the PR after that because you have a cushion of about five hours during that week that you could reduce the volume if you, mm. you got to pay attention to yourself if you're going too far. Because uh, that Z2 you could reduce. Yeah, if you want to do those PRs, so you don't have to do it, I think, at the end. But normally, you know, if what we were all saying, if you're on the low volume plan and you're just, you know, you're, you're recovering just in time for the next, next workout, you're progressing, but you're also, you do get tired, I would not do those those big all out efforts that you see John do in like the, the 20 to. teens, <laughs> yeah. 20 teens. <laughs> yeah. 20 teens. <laughs> what do we call that time frame? Um, the, the one interesting, uh, the one cool part about that, Nate, is that you're looking at it as like, it's a fixed time frame. Like you have six hours or whatever it is, or 10 hours. And if you do take, add in these hard efforts, you're taking that out of the 10 hours instead of just making it 11 hours or something more like you have to look at it as it has a real cost, just like budgeting. Like you can't just like expect to spend the money and then expect it to vapor, Ooh. you know, vaporize or something like that. We yep. should use that more often, like budget yeah. system and your fatigue is your credit card. And that oh, credit card yes. can have a huge interest rate too. And if yes. you spend up too much and go and you just cannot recover, you cannot oh, pay down your one. credit card. Why haven't we done this? That, that's, that's amazing. Video, I feel video upcoming. Yeah, it's video upcoming. <laughs> but you, but what you do is you get earn points. I mean, we can stretch this even further. And you just you do a legit amount. Yes. You recover, and you have all these points that you then spend on race day. Uh, mm -hmm. People know, are going to ask if you can use the points in different zones, just like you know, transfer it from one card to another. I can see it already. Exactly. So, yeah, and you get a bonus for signing up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we can the we'll stretch it. response and you pick your goal event. It's totally real. Like you do get it. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's crazy. Everything is meta. Um, okay. From Crawford, my quote homies, see what you're starting Ivy. Uh, my homies and I have signed <laughs> up for the sunrise to sunset mountain bike race in Castle Rock, Colorado. It's a 6.5 mile, 90% single track lapped mountain bike race. I do just, the first thing that stands out to me is just thinking of doing a short lap race like this. And have it be 90% single track passing would be a nightmare. Like, Oh, that could be the right. Like that. That's the first concern that comes to my mind. I'm just like, Oh gosh, yeah, I'd be stuck. That's cause <laughs> John Ivy saying yes too. That's cause they're fast AF. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking of like, shoot, I gotta get off the trail so many times and stop my momentum because someone's like on your left. We can get a chance uh, over and over so, every two minutes. Fair point. Yep. Yeah. Fair point. Yeah. Right. Um, the idea is to get as many laps in as a team in the 12 hour race period. My question is how should we go about setting our strategy for the race? We're all mountain bikers and road racers with endurance training backgrounds. Should we split the 12 hours into four blocks of three hours or should we take or Should we each take an hour and rotate? Should we sprint one lap and then switch off? My thought is that minimizing transitions between riders cuts out the most dead time. And that would be the fastest option. What are your thoughts? Nate, there's like so much game theory behind this. Like, I want you to leave. I'm not ready on this, but I'm not ready. You're not, you're not ready. Okay. Sorry. I've got Ivy. Okay, do you, you have thoughts on this? Cause I've got some, I've got some ready to go to. I mean, I do just want to say that, uh, I think, you know, starting really fast and, you know, sprinting at the beginning to try to navigate how many times you're going to try to pass people is almost moot because on a course like this, when you're doing a 12 hour race, you're going to keep lapping the same people. It seems like passing is something that you're just going to have to deal with and starting really hard might be a good strategy, but it doesn't change that you're going to have to keep navigating how to pass riders throughout the entire duration. So I almost, I almost don't know what to say like to this ride to the team, you know? That's a good point. Like if you go really fast, that doesn't mean you don't have to pass, but if you do right. go really fast, that likely means that you'll be ahead. You'll, you might save a significant amount of time. That said, it's only six and a half miles each lap. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's pretty short. And depending on where the breaks and the single track are, that could really change things. I, I look at this, like physiologically speaking, it's a six and a half mile loop. You could do that really fast. Um, if it's 90% single tracking and assume that your average speed on a mountain bike, if you're a fast athlete, it might be somewhere around 10 to 12 miles an hour. If you are a mid pack athlete, it's going to be somewhere between eight to 10 miles an hour. And then below that, it's going to be somewhere like six to eight miles an hour. That's typically like what you see with cross country racing speeds on typical courses. So <clears throat> looking at that, you're going to get this one done pretty quick. Like you could do this lap and you know, 35, 40 minutes, quite easy. Uh, if you're a fast rider and then as a result, 
you're looking at 35 minutes, that's an all out effort. And if you have, in this case, if you have a handful of you so that you can take three to, you know, or you have three or four, I think athletes in this case, it doesn't um, say, but I'm going to assume four for my answer Four because of the math, right. Would break out to four would make sense. Mm -hmm. So if there's four of you, man, like you could really, uh, you could really put in some fast, hard efforts because of how short it is in terms of how you could switch. And the difference typically we, we talk about this and we have an article on our blog about pacing and how the shorter, like when you look at the difference in terms of power that you can hold for one second to 10 seconds, that difference is huge. When you look at it in the terms of what you can hold for 15 minutes or 20 minutes, it's much less. And when you look at it for what you can hold for a half hour to an hour, the difference is very small and it keeps getting smaller as the duration gets longer. So I would want to physiologically speaking, push you guys to the shorter end of the spectrum so that you can put in really fast, hard laps and likely get more, um, like use more of the speed and the power that you have built up within you. So my head, my in initial one, since you have four of you, that means that you could have a significant time of rest in between. And then you could probably just hit out really hard laps if you swapped every time. But Crawford brings up a good point on the logistics of swapping riders. If that takes a long time, then it might completely nullify it. Yeah. Where is it on the course? Is it on the one road section where you want to be mobbing, uh, oh, or yeah, is it, point. you know, at the exit of a single track when you're moving kind of slow anyways, do you have to pull off and go through a tent and like a weird, like thing that adds on like another minute and a half right. every time you do it, you know? Yeah. Uh, so what I think they should do is they should do hour laps because an hour lap or not hour lap. Sorry. <laughs> Every hour they should switch turns. <laughs> yeah. So if there's four of them and they switch every hour, that gives you three hours of rest between a hard hour ride and attrition is going to be big in this. And you're going to think about glycogen and replenishing it between, but three hours is a really good time window to be able to have either recovery or even a light meal. That's, you know, lots of carbs, simple carbs still to be able to re replenish that and be pretty rested in that three hours. If you're doing every 30 minutes, you really don't get that like parasympathetic or every you know, if the lap is like 30 minutes, it's going to come a lot faster than you want it to where three hours is enough to chill, like go down, eat, chill, and then ramp back up. And I think that's going to be the best for each rider to perform really well, um, during that whole time and anything longer than an hour. I don't know. It depends on how good y'all are, but on single track, your body gets tired and like, Oh yeah. When the more, when I get more tired, I just, everything's worse, right? And you're going to be tired anyways in this. So I'd rather have just an hour of like upper body work at once than like 90 minutes or two, or even you you suggested three hours. That would be tough. Yeah. I would do two laps. So do two laps. That's probably going to be work out to be somewhere close to an hour and then maybe a little longer than that, but do your two laps and then swap two laps and then swap. And if you do that, that gives you the time frame like Nate's talking about where you can have that. What would you eat in between? those, those rides to, to have like, you know, carbs, but also like what things would you avoid? I'd have pre-made recovery shakes with, uh, protein and carbs and probably, I don't know, I've, maybe a four to one. Uh, and then I would probably do a lot of like cereal. Um, I want lower fat lactose free cereal with oat milk, probably honestly just cereal because at races like this, it is so easy to eat cereal and it's fun. And you can do Captain Cruncher. This is like the one time that Captain Cruncher is okay. Uh, and you do like Ezekiel or something like that. Uh, yeah, that's what I would do. And then you might even oh. want something savory in there too. Yeah, I would pack a little uh, lunch box, like a cooler box with some uh, savory rice balls, I think, also to eat. You like a rice, rice chicken lunch. with teriyaki? Like, yeah, rice cakes most, would like, be good. Yum. Yeah. Something, uh, you would probably want to stay from really fatty foods or things that like, uh, be slower to digest. Um, and then, but bring a variety. I feel like that's like a really key thing. It's not like you're having to eat all this stuff on the bike. Uh, instead you get to like, enjoy the time in between and bring a variety. Last time we did 24 hours in the old Pueblo with my brother and a, in a ragtag bunch of crew, like, um, it wasn't ideal nutrition that we had in between, but we had a huge variety. We had like, uh, we had rice cakes. We had somebody brought their pizza oven and we made pizzas and that was delicious. Oh um, so then like in between, like somebody, it was like swapping shifts and like somebody was making pizzas for everyone. And we <laughs> oh just like, it was so That's much so fun. fun. <laughs> that was a blast. I mean, we need to do 24 hours in the old Pueblo again. Um, it's a blast. Uh, Nate, right, Nate's I'm out. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, 
but this, uh, the, I think the main thing that with all of these relay races is you have to look at like your physiological limits and where to leverage those versus the logistics of everything. And when I say logistics, I'm talking about time off and being able to eat and refuel and then how much time that is in between the efforts. But typically like an hour, if for most of these courses, unless you have really short laps, you might want to change the course, but somewhere around an hour, because after that hour, you're going to see a point of diminishing returns. Like you can really stretch yourself for that hour and get a lot of speed, but then thereafter you're going to get pretty tired and you'll probably want to slow down or adjust your pacing throughout the whole race because of that. But for that hour, you can kind of, you can go pinned on a mountain bike more or less because you'll just be bouncing over unders, uh, for more or less the whole time. Uh, okay. Uh, Sarah's question. Uh, we're going to get to this one says, uh, I'm looking for some advice regarding hydration. Although my question is not of the usual variety during long rides that early start in the morning, I often find myself having to pee multiple times within the first 90 minutes. This doesn't happen nearly as often on midday or afternoon rides. And while I always try to match my salt intake on the bike at my, or to my salt loss via sweat, I evidently haven't gotten the right balance for those early morning, morning rides. I have a glass of plain water when I wake up in the morning and I suspect that contributes, but I don't drink coffee or any other potential, uh, diuretic. Those morning rides are colder and all. And so I also may be taking in more fluids and electrolytes than I'm losing because I take in most of my nutrition through my bottle off the bike. I also seem to have a small bladder relative to others. Uh, then Sarah mentions, I have the Canadian gravel championships at the end of April. The race starts at 8 AM and I really don't want to ha want to have to get off the bike during the race to pee once, let alone multiple times for long races. How do you manage the risks of under hydrating versus over hydrating the morning of any guidance you have regarding electrolyte loading or other mind over bladder. That's a good one. You should trademark that one, Sarah, um, uh, mind over bladder strategies would be very welcome for context. The race will, will likely take between three and a half to four hours and the temperature that day could be any anywhere between five to 25 degrees Celsius. So keep crushing the podcast game. And thanks for an awesome training product from Sarah. Um, I want to cover really quick, like why we uh, cyclists have to pee more often. Uh, this was covered in a previous episode. Uh, basically there's kind of like two theories behind this as part of the flight or flight response and that the increased stress causes a hormone change. And those hormones typically regulate the urge and necessity to use the restroom. And as a result that can cause it. And in almost every case, it causes you to feel like you need to pee more often when that stress increases. Uh, there's also anxiety induced hyperalgesia, which basically is, um, that's like increased awareness when we are in like a stressed or, uh, anxious environment, it increases our awareness of the sensations that we feel. And it also makes them feel more urgent and more pressing. So in those situations where you may actually, if you were to like somehow quantify it, it might only be like a two out of 10 where you have to go to bathroom. But because you're in that state, that two out of 10 feels like an eight out of 10. And as a result, you then follow those, those, uh, promptings a bit more. Um, all that said, uh, that's probably why this sort of thing is happening. Um, in terms of why it's happening to you more frequently, perhaps than other athletes, that's a different, uh, potentially different story. I didn't notice Sarah mentioned that they take in their carbs through their bottle, like drinking. Um, and it seems like they take in most of their stuff through there. And in this case, it seems like that might be causing additional problems, but Ivy, what recommendations do you have for Sarah? I don't know if you've had teammates or yourself, if you've experienced this before. Oh yeah. Um, I'm just thinking about too, in something like a gravel race, how much time you could potentially lose in the race by being under hydrated, uh, and really putting yourself in a hole. Um, how much time, you, you know, she's worried about time how much time you could lose versus, uh, how much time you would lose to just race, race, stop, like pee really quick, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, it's pretty asymmetrical, right? Um, so I wouldn't err on the side of trying to play with how little you can hydrate and how little fluid you can get away with, uh, to try to save yourself from having to stop. If you have to stop, um, because you've hydrated appropriately, then it's, that's something that's okay. I would never err on the side of, uh, under hydrating or not fueling correctly to make sure you don't have to stop, um, because of how much you can lose mm. it's in the morning, in the morning, Sarah, um, that first thing of water, I put electrolytes in that and that will help. Um, so you absorb more and you won't pee as much. And also the glass of water, it depends on how you drink it. The faster you ramp up, like your, um, your extra hydration, your plasma volume, the, the faster your body tries to put it back down. 
So if you sip it over some time, you'll probably retain a lot better than if you, you know, some people get up in the morning, they're like, I got to chug a whole glass and they just do that. That's going to be a, a really um, guaranteed way to pee it all out pretty soon afterwards. Mm -hmm. the and we'll pee on the I, bike. Oh. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> Best I, of both worlds. <laughs> I it's it's hard to that's a skill though. You have to learn how to do it, right? Like especially in a gravel Practice race. Practice on my trainer really every day. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, gross. <laughs> <laughs> Can't take the triathlete out of the man. It's there. <laughs> Cannot. It's there forever. <laughs> um in this case, I'm looking at Sarah's situation. Um and Sarah, I would experiment with, so first of all, I would look at like your sweat rate and you can get this figured out pretty simply with just a scale at home. Uh, what you can do is you can start out, have your bottles and have like the, everything loaded up and you stand on the scale. And then when you finish the ride, do the same thing and then see how much fluid you've lost, um, or how much weight you've lost and then figure that out in terms of cross bring the weight or the weight of how much you've lost over to fluid. And then you can figure out how much you lose in a typical time frame. And I would start out at trying to replenish that. And then you can work up from there in hotter conditions, but I would just start on trying to like replenish that and making that the goal. That could be a good guideline in terms of finding how much fluid you need to replace. I would always make sure that I'm taking in electrolytes with that. And in this case, if you're taking in your carbs through your bottles as well, I might actually try taking in your carbs separately. So then that way you don't get yourself in a situation where <clears throat> Maybe you drink way too much because you're trying to get enough carbs in and that's causing you to pee. Um, certain athletes have weird, like they lose a lot of sodium or they lose a lot of fluid, or maybe they're, those two are very different. And as a result, it gets really tricky on how to fuel. Um, I'm like perfectly like center of bell curve in every aspect of my life. I feel like, and this is one of them. I don't have to worry no. about that. I have like. I have my mix and it's just, I drink the same amount that I lose in terms of fluid and it ends up managing my hydration and my fuel also very effectively, but it's not that way across the board. So you'll kind of want to try separating them. That said, if it's at the end of April, it's kind of late to massively change your nutrition strategy. And that's likely going to lead to more risk that could harm your day even more. Um, um, just some one thing you said at the end, so we don't, I know you don't have to drink to exactly replace. Sure. Yeah. Being, being slightly dehydrated, there's a there's a bit, and this is you could play with fire, right? As Ivy said, a bit of dehydration, and then you fall off a cliff when you hit a certain point, and that is also what you can play with in training. Uh, I did that leading up to Cape Epic, uh, you, but you definitely don't have to go one for one. You could do a two percent body loss. I think and be just fine. Yeah, it's probably just a good spot more. to. St yeah. If you have the question of how much fluid should I take in, it's probably a good place to start. You know. Yeah, and in training too, it's like that's not a bad thing to replace it. Like, I don't think you're going to, uh, do any harm as long as you have electrolytes too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now the other thing, just, this is just anecdote. Um, but a good friend of mine, very, very good athlete, um, mentioned that pre-race and mid-race bathroom breaks or the urge to go to bathroom dropped substantially in parallel with pelvic floor training, uh, that they were doing. They were doing it for a totally different purpose. And they were just like, holy cow, this is an amazing perk. They mentioned that they had spoken to a lot of different athletes after that, that had gone through similar things. And they all mentioned the same thing that it helped them a lot with this. That's an anecdote. Uh, that's not scientific. That's not anything else. That's just uh, what's helped some athletes. And I'm passing it along because maybe Sarah, in this case, it could be helpful. That is scientific is that pelvic floor training does help with, um, uh, bladder control. Yeah. For those who have issues, scientific. but not everyone has, yeah, not everyone has issues, but for those who do, it does help me sharing my friend who did this and the, that part isn't scientific, but yeah. what the root is <laughs> perhaps within it. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, could be that case. Uh, overall, one thing I've found is that if I, and sometimes I really just have to go, but in most cases in a race, like in the beginning of the race, I always have to pee and I feel like I need to pee. And then later on, if I just like ignore it and I focus on the race, I, it's amazing how like every time after like, I don't know, 15 minutes into the race, 20 minutes into the race, I'm like, oh, I guess I don't have to go that bad anymore. Like my body, <laughs> it's probably that uh, anxiety induced hyperalgesia that we have, which also there's also exercise induced hyperalgesia that when we exercise, we feel heightened. Uh, we have like a heightened awareness of all those things as well. So maybe it's because that starts to wear off or something, but I've found that if I pay attention to that too early then it will take control of me almost. And I need to just trust the fact that, okay, later on I can go beyond this urge that I feel and I can, I can just focus on what I need to. Same thing with drinking. I've had the 
I had like dry mouth and I was like, oh, I need to drink. I need to drink. And then I would just told myself, it's fine. You're not dehydrated. You don't have to worry about it. And once I got used to it, then I didn't have to worry about it anymore. So hopefully that's helpful uh, for you, Sarah. Thanks y'all. Appreciate it. If you're listening to this and you're, or first of all, if you're watching on YouTube, thumbs up, subscribe, you can even hit notifications because we have lots of videos coming out. If you haven't been to trainerroad.com, you should go check it out. You should use it because of AI FTP detection. You don't have to do tests anymore. It just watches all your training and it figures it out for you. It's automatic. It's amazing. Adaptive training is going to give you the right workout at the right time. It's incredible. We have amazing things coming, but you should go use it. Uh, maybe you've got events coming up and you've just been kind of like training by whatever. Uh, now is a great time to jump in, use plan builder. It might just give you a specialty phase or something before your goal event, and it'll drop you right in, give you this fitness that you need to have the best one yet. So go to trainerroad.com, sign up, review the podcast, share it with your friends. We'll talk to you all next week. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Love you. Bye.